like to wait. Anybody here have a bucket list, something that you want to do, something that you want to have happen in your life before you kick the proverbial bucket? Yeah, quite a few of you. I, um, b- before I became pastor here, I uh, m- made someone aware here uh, in the church that I was an avid golfer. Uh, now, that doesn't mean I'm a great golfer. Uh, there, there's a difference. And he said, hey, I, I have tickets for the Masters. Well, he didn't know, but this is the like one thing, uh, one of several things that had been on my bucket list ever since I was a kid. Just the, the big idea. I'd never been to Augusta, Georgia. I'd never been to Masters Golf. And so everything was working out just perfectly. It was weeks before I would actually arrive here in Georgia becoming your pastor, uh, all I had to do was get on a plane in Fort Lauderdale, fly to Atlanta, jump in his car, and we were going to travel to the opening honorary tee shots with Jack Nicholas and Gary Player. And everything was set. So uh, from what I remember, it was the Wednesday before the Thursday of the tournament, and my flight is at 6 o'clock. So four hours early, I said, honey, let's go. I want you to drop me off at the Fort Lauderdale airport. There's no way I'm going to miss this flight, right? Right. So I get through the line, I get through TSA, I've got like three hours to spare. There's no possible way that I'm going to miss my flight to Atlanta, right? Shake your head, right? There's no possible way. So it's four o'clock and now it's five o'clock, it's just an hour away. I'm like a kid before Christmas. I can't wait to, to see Tiger Woods and Phil Mickelson go battle it out for the green jacket. Finally, I'm going to get to go somewhere I've wanted to go since I was a kid, to to Augusta, Georgia, to the home of a Masters Golf Tournament. And at about 5 o'clock, from what I remember, uh, someone on the intercom came on. Uh, A flight has been delayed. I'm thinking, oh, poor people, right? (laughs) Uh, The flight to Atlanta, the 6 o'clock flight has been delayed. And I'm thinking, oh, man, of all the flights that it could have been delayed uh, in Fort Lauderdale to who knows where, Mozambique, uh, my flight gets delayed. But it's still going to go out at 8 o'clock, right? So I think no biggie, uh, I'll still make my tea time, uh, I'll still get there just in time. And uh, little did I know that there was announcement after announcement after announcement until just a few minutes before midnight, I walked up to the flight desk and the lady said, I'm so sorry, Mr. Coleman, but your flight to Atlanta has been canceled. Do you know what it's like to see a grown man cry in an airport? Do do you know what it's like to have something you've wanted to have happen your whole life long and you miss out on that moment? Well, I bring that up today because today we're going to go to a single story in the Bible, a Christmas story of all things, to a guy who had something come up on his bucket list that he wanted to have happen, something he wanted to have happen before he died. We're going to discover what it was, why it was so important to him, and why it should matter 2,000 years later to someone like you and someone like me on this first day of December. Isn't that awesome? December has just started, the first Sunday of December. And maybe you're here today, or maybe you're watching online, and maybe you have something on your own bucket list. Now, when I, when I say that, I'm not talking about a month in Tahiti. I'm not talking about winning the lottery. I'm talking about maybe you have something in your life that God has promised to have happen in your life. Maybe it's health-related. Maybe it's family-related or relationship-related or about the dream that God may have given you or whatever it might be. Today, 
we're gonna discover how a highly unlikely individual had the number one thing on his bucket list come true in his life, and we're gonna to learn together how all that happened. Well, good morning, Wes Cobb. I hope you had as wonderful Thanksgiving week as we did uh, with the family. We had a great time. And by the way, I just wanna say thank you to Todd Graham, our family pastor. Didn't he do a great job last week talking about gratitude? It was fantastic. We've got a great team. Here Before we go on, a number of years ago, there was a show on TV on the USA Network that peered into these unlikely unique individuals. It was called Characters Welcome. Now, I never watched the show, but I borrowed this title for our Christmas series. Our, our series title is actually called Characters Welcome. Each and every Sunday between now and Christmas, we're going to explore the, the characters of people that we see around the nativity sets huddled around the manger. Uh, who have made cameo appearances in the drama of God made flesh that first Christmas. We're gonna go behind the scenes and look at these sometimes unlikely and often overlooked characters that got caught up in the story of Jesus. For example, you can't miss next week. Next week, we're gonna go to Jesus' family tree, his genealogy. You thought your family tree was whack this week, right? Remember Aunt Gertrude and Uncle Harry? You remember me? Oh man, I can't believe they're in my family tree. You will hardly believe who's in Jesus' family tree. And each and every week, we're gonna look at specific stories and characters that were in the original Christmas story right up to Christmas Eve, where we're gonna talk about the innkeeper, who, by the way, gets a bad rap. I think. And we're going to talk about why it's important, by the way, between now and then, to get your family members, your coworkers, your friends, your neighbors to show up for a family friendly one hour Christmas service where we're going to have great singing, great stuff for kids as well, and parents and families, but where I'm going to help people open their heart, wherever they are in their journey, to the greatest gift the world has ever given us to give them hope and life and salvation through Christ. So I hope you're building your list and checking your twice, uh, checking it twice, the invite list for people to come, whether they're naughty or nice. Today, our first Christmas character is a man who sort of lived his whole life with one thing on his bucket list. He's now getting old and gray, and he's advanced in years. And this one thing that he wanted to have happen in his life has not yet occurred. This one thing he wants to have happen on his bucket list, and the chances of it happening before he expires are slim and none, and it seems like none just left the Judean landscape. We actually know very little about Simeon in the Bible. He appears sort of in the shadows of the gospel story around that very first Christmas we don't know anything about Simeon's family. We don't know anything about Simeon's occupation. We don't know where he was born. We only know what Dr. Luke tells us about our boy named Simeon. And so Sim often Luke, he would uh, peer into uh, the, the details of people's lives. And so all the bio we get on Simeon is found in Luke 2, verse 25. Look at, look, look at it with me. There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. That's about what we know about Simeon. You see the word waiting. The word waiting was underlined there. And the reason for that is, I don't know if you're aware, today officially begins the Advent season. For those of you who were raised Catholic or Episcopalian or Methodist or in a very religious-like church, you know more about the Advent season than most of us do. But Advent is a season for remembering and rejoicing, for watching and waiting. It's a time to reflect upon the promises of God fulfilled by and in the coming of Christ that first Christmas. And so Advent reminds, it, reminds us all of how hard it is to wait for something to have happen in your life. Now, to get behind the scenes of Simeon's story, I have to take you back for a moment in, in, in the story of the Bible and in human history. I need to take you back to a time when God created the world and everything in it, including, including human beings who were made in his image. And he declares that it was good, but then something bad happened, right? Right? Man, Adam and Eve, chose willfully to sin against God, 
to take the light of the Garden of Eden and to dispel it into darkness. Thankfully, this story doesn't end in the dark. Because I don't know if you're aware, early on in the Genesis story, the Bible says that one day God will uh, redeem mankind by sending light to the world. Later, a prophet named Isaiah comes along, and I want you to see what Isaiah prophesies. He says, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. He's speaking prophetically. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, upon them a light has shone, or rather, a light will shine. And so all throughout the Old Testament pages, you have prophet after prophet after prophet talk about the coming of a great light, the coming of a rescuer, the coming of a Messiah. And they waited and waited and waited. Do you like to wait? The years turned into decades. The decades turned into centuries. The centuries turned into millennia. And yet God continued, continued to send prophet after prophet to remind them of a coming one who would come to rescue Israel and bring glory to God. But then, when you get to the final pages of the Old Testament, the last prophet, Malachi, I heard someone there, they call him Malachi. It's Malachi, Malachi. He makes a declaration, and then for 400 years, nothing is said about this promised Messiah. Only silence, crickets, for 400 years. Which brings us back to our story today, to the story of Simeon, who was, all we know is he was righteous and devout, and he was waiting. That word is a word of expectancy. It's not like a word of sluggardliness. He was waiting with expectancy for what? The consolation of Israel. He was waiting for this Messiah that was commissioned to come. He was waiting for the one thing on his bucket list to occur that he would see and he would meet and he would worship the one who'd been promised since Genesis. Now, before I unveil what happened to our first character in Characters Welcome, Simeon, I want you to see how staggering the odds were against this even happening, much less before old Simeon kicks the bucket. If you're here today and you're not feeling close to God, if you're spiritually still seeking the Lord and you've got a lot of questions about Christianity and about Jesus, we welcome you. We're glad to have you in the conversation. And you'll appreciate this. Throughout the Old Testament, there are over 300 different prophecies about a coming Messiah, specifically exactly related to who the prophet would be and who the Messiah would be and different things. For example, outlandish promises of like he would be born in Bethlehem and a virgin would conceive a baby. Like, really? <laughs> and his name would be called Emmanuel, meaning God with us, things like that. So here's a question I would have. If I was skeptical about God and the Bible and Christianity, I would want to know what's the likelihood of over 300 specific Old Testament prophecies actually being fulfilled about Jesus? What are the odds of that happening? Well, did you know a mathematician by the name of Peter Stoner actually did the math on this? And I've done some reading on this about fulfilling just eight of the 300 different prophecies. Here was his conclusion, quote, we find that the chance that any man might have lived down to the present time and fulfilled all eight prophecies is one in 10 to the 17th power. Now, if you flunk math or you're just not good with numbers, I want you to see the enormity of this number. Let's put it up on the screen. That's one with 17 consecutive zeros to the 17th power. To help us comprehend the staggering probability, Stoner writes that illustrating this, it would be like taking 10 to the 17th power silver dollars and placing all these silver dollars in a big state, the state of Texas, which is my home state. Everything is bigger in Texas, but the Cowboys keep losing. And, and they would cover the state two feet deep in silver dollars. Then he says, you take a magic marker and you mark one silver dollar, and then you mix them up in mass. You blindfold a person and say, you go wherever you want, all across Texas, to all the silver dollars that are two feet deep, and you pick out a single silver dollar and to say that this is the exact right one. What are the chances of that happening? And here's what Stoner concludes, a mathematician, not even a Christian at the time. He said, just the same chance that the prophets would have had of writing these eight prophecies and having them all come true in any one man hundreds and hundreds of years later. 
And yet, friends, listen up. Jesus of Nazareth, he fulfilled every single prediction exactly like the Bible promises he would, over 300 of them. That would help me understand that there's more going on in this story. And I bring that up today because there's someone under the sound of my voice that you've got something in your life that you'd like to have happen, a dream that God gave you, something about health, something about a wayward child, something about a promotion, something about your finances, something about your future, whatever it might be. And the odds at this point, you look back and say, I'm not even sure that this is ever going to happen. The odds are rather stacked against me at this point. I was mentioning this week to one of our daughters that we got to be with in East Texas. Her husband, our son-in-law, is a worship pastor. She's a creative arts director, and they've got three incredible kids. God gave her a promise in 2014 that she would have a child in 2014. And so she said, okay, God, I'm going to trust you for that. We'd love to have a child. And the problem was, it was early January now of the promise of 2014. And sadly, our daughter miscarried a baby. It's so devastating to have your hopes dashed like that, even for Papa and Mim. And so we hurt for our children. We hurt for our baby who would now be with the Lord and... She was mad at God, she told me. I didn't know that until this week. She said, I was mad at God. Why, God? Why would you give me a promise and then, like, dash my promises? But she said that she had just enough faith to say, well, God, if you told me that, I'm going to take you at your word. So I'm going to keep believing it, even though it doesn't look like it's going to happen. Well, friends, late in December of that same year, she reminded me of this. 2014, she gave birth to our Our middle daughter gave birth to little Esri, Ann. This past week, we were in Texas. uh, We got to see Frozen 2. Esri's the little smiling one at the bottom who got to meet Elsa. We've added little Levi, the first boy in our family in a long time. And that's little Ruthie Joy in the red. And you know, my wife and I and my son-in-law, John, and my daughter, Bailey. Here's what I want to say. Simeon was waiting, waiting, waiting for a promise. The consolation of Israel. Consolation means the comfort, the hope. God longs to give you hope. He longs to give you consolation. He longs to give you encouragement. But there's often a gap between what you have promised to you and the waiting. Right after Luke tells us this guy named Simeon is waiting, the very next verse, verse 26, and it had been revealed to him, watch this, by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he'd seen the Lord's Christ. God clearly gave Simeon a promise. To those of you to whom God has given a promise, here's what I want you to know today. While you are waiting, God is working. While you are waiting, God is behind the scenes working all things for your good and his glory. I don't know about you, but I'm a terrible waiter. When we traveled to Texas and back, I would go into the restrooms to, you know, go to the restroom and I would wash my hands. I am such a terrible waiter that once you get the soap on, I put my hands, you know how the electric things, they infrared, they they just go on or off. You know, I put them under two different sinks to see which one will start first because I can't wait that long, right? I'm a horrible, no good, bad waiter. Well, some of you have waited and waited and waited. You've waited for that relationship. You've waited for that dream job. You've waited for that family member to come back home, whatever it might be. But here's the deal. While you are waiting, while I am waiting, God is working. But watch this. You have to be watching. You have to be watching. You have to be listening. You have to be leaning into the Holy Spirit to allow the Holy Spirit to guide you to what's next. That's what Simeon did. Simeon has this immense promise and hope revealed by the Holy Spirit, but he doesn't stand idly by in an easy chair in Jerusalem, twiddling his thumbs, it'll never work. No. As Simeon's now older and grayer and dissipating in years, wondering, will this ever happen in my lifetime? Verse 27, and he came, there there it is again, in the Spirit, into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law. The custom of the law was circumcision. And it was time to bring baby Jesus to his rite of circumcision. And it says, on the exact same day, 
that Jesus was, Mary and Joseph were bringing Jesus into the temple, the Holy Spirit guided our boy Simeon, the character in our story, to the exact place where the Messiah would show up. He guided Simeon. So while Simeon was waiting, he was also watching for God to somehow, some way, someday show up for him. Now, as far as we know, as far as we know, our first character in Characters Welcome wasn't a prophet, a priest, a king, a pastor. Yet he seemed far more in tune with God than the scholars who were paid to study and the scribes who were paid to teach. He knew enough to listen intently to the voice of the Holy Spirit that while he was waiting for the consolation of Israel, he was watching for what God might do next. And I wanna say a word today to those of you to whom God has given a promise. Maybe it's a promise for your marriage or a promise for your health or a promise for your business venture or a promise for a dream that God gave you. Simeon didn't sit back, Jack, sit idly, twiddle dee, twiddle da. I'm quite sure he persevered through a lot of highs and a lot of lows, a lot of ups and a lot of downs, but he stayed the course. He persevered in faith. He stayed connected to God and he listened to the voice of the Holy Spirit and was fulfilled in the promise that God had for him. Listen, if you want God's promise to come true in your life, you have to activate your faith. You have to activate your faith. You cannot even please God, the Bible says, without faith. You have to trust that what God has said will eventually come true. And so while God is waiting, while we are waiting, God is working. And like Simeon, we have to be watching. We have to be trusting along the way. Imagine now how Simeon's heart must have leapt with joy as he sees Mary and Joseph and now the promise light of Israel, the hope of Israel, the consolation of Israel arrives that day. Mary Jo, would you mind if I held your baby in my arms? He actually, the Bible says, held Jesus in his arms. And we read that in his arms that day, Simeon carries this frail newborn baby whose arms would one day carry Simeon from sin to salvation. In his arms are the tiny savior of the world whose arms hold the whole world in his hands. And verse 28 says, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, and what, what Simeon then shares, what wells up in Simeon's heart is I'm quite certain something he's practiced for years and years and years in case the promise comes true, which it does. And now it's a prayer that's been memorized and sung and framed from caves to cathedrals all throughout history. Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you will prepare in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. In that moment, the one thing on old Simeon's mind, his bucket list, the one thing he wanted to have happen before he died had just occurred. I've seen the light, Lord. I've seen salvation. Now you can dismiss me. I will depart. I will die in peace. Friends, this was no ordinary baby in the arms of Simeon that day. He would not only be Simeon's salvation, but the salvation of the whole world. This is the one to whom God spoke to Abraham when he promised the patriarchs heir would bless all the nations of the world. This is the one of whom God spoke to David when he said, your monarch will have an everlasting kingdom. This is the one of whom Isaiah said, he will be wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father and prince of peace. He will be Emmanuel, the God who is with us. And now good, old, devout, and righteous Simeon can die. A happy man. Not because he had checked off a religious box, not because he performed an outward religious symbol in the temple that day, but because Simeon had finally met and adored the Messiah, and he could die a happy man. Now, some people think that this is a story that gives people permission to die if you want to die. That's not what this is about. And often when we think of death is not a great conversation around Christmas. Wow, pastor, thanks for bringing death up around Christmas, right? 
We usually think of a Norman Rockwell image in our minds or Jimmy Stewart's oh, It's a Wonderful Life. Yet Simeon knows now he can face all of eternity and the future death, which is something that all of us will one day face because he had met the Prince of Peace who would soon conquer sin, death, and the grave for him. It wasn't that he was seeking death, and neither should we. It's a sweet assurance that if and when your time comes, and I'm quite sure it will one day, it may be tomorrow, it may be 20 years, 40 years, 60 years from now, that if you have met, if you have held, if you have worshiped and followed this same Jesus that Simeon did, then you have peace in this life and you have eternity in the life to come. So here's what I want us to do beginning this first day of December, the first Sunday of the last month of the year. Here's the question I want you to ask. Where in your life do you need to keep waiting and watching because God is working? Where in your life, where in my life, do you and I need to keep waiting and watching? Why? Because God is working. What promise do you need to hold on to that God has given you? There's a great verse in Hebrews. The writer says, keep a firm grip on the promises, watch this, that keep us going. See, promises are like an energizer bunny if you let them. They will, you will keep going and going and going if you'll hold on to the promises. So you can't give up on the promises. He, that is God, always keeps his word. They did a word study on the word always. It means always. Totally reliable. 100% accurate. Sink into your spirit today that you should keep a firm grip on the promises of God. Why? Because they keep you going and, and he's utterly reliable. He's the ultimate promise keeper. He always, always, always fulfills his promises. Most of you know, I grew up in church. Nine months before I was born, I think I was in church. I went Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, sometimes Monday night. My parents weren't pastors or paid ministers. They just loved Jesus, and they loved the local church, the hope of the world. We used to sing hymns in our church growing up, and one of the hymns, I still remember, it meant a lot to me, was called Standing on the Promises. Some of you remember it. I've never told anybody this, not even my wife, not my family, but when I was a real young kid and I first heard that song, I thought they were singing about me. I thought it was Stanley, Stanley, Stanley on the Promises of God. I thought they wrote a song about me. Someone thought enough about me to write a song about me and God. Guess what? Someone actually did. The last line went, standing on the promises, I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, Stanley on the pro standing on the promises of God. And then it resonates, standing, standing, standing on the promises of Christ, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. And later I realized it really wasn't about me. It was about God. It was about God's promise to me, not my promise to God. It was not my faithfulness to God. It was his faithfulness to me. It was not all the hard work I was going to do for decades for God. It was the hard work, the finished work that he'd done for me. And as long as I'm standing on the right thing, I'm balanced. I'm strong. I'm ready. I'm willing. I'm able to walk in my future with a grip on the promises of God. What are you standing on? Are you standing on your possessions? It's so important what you have, but have you discovered that now what you have has you? Some of you stand on your past. You can't let go of your past. That's why they call it the past. You can't live in 2020 moving forward, driving by looking straight into the rear view mirror and looking into your past. You just can't keep living like that. You will crouch in fear and insecurity. You gotta get over your hurts, habits, and hangups. And the sooner you let it go, better. Some of you are standing on your good intentions. 
and you think, man, Christmas is a hard season, and I want to acknowledge it is a hard season for a lot of us, especially those of you who've lost a family member this year. I'm sorry. It's a hard season. But you say, I'm going to gut it up, and I'm going to pull myself up by my proverbial boots, and I'm going to make it through this Christmas even if it kills me. Sometimes it will. If you don't balance your life emotionally, financially, spiritually, you could be teeter-tottering. If you're not standing on a solid foundation, the promises of God. Simeon was waiting for the consolation of Israel. He was righteous and just and devout and with hope-filled expectation, he walked into his future and his bucket list was fulfilled. Do you have anything left on your bucket list? Not, not Tahiti, not winning the lottery. I'm talking about a promise that God has made to you specifically. I want to tell you today, keep waiting and keep watching because God will keep on working. All over this room, can we just bow our heads? Our Father in heaven, I want to thank you for the Christmas season. Some of us aren't ready for it. Others of us wish it would have started a month ago. Either way, waiting is hard work. Rejoicing and remembering, waiting and watching, waiting, waiting, waiting. God, I, I confess that for a lot of us, waiting is hard. Waiting is painful. But God, a great reminder today that while we are waiting, God, I want to ask, I want to invite Holy Spirit, just as you led Simeon into the temple on the exact day, that you would lead us by your Spirit into a season where you resource us, you give us wisdom. Your word says that all the promises of God find their yes in your son, Jesus. You're here today. And you've never, you've been skeptical about Christ. You, you hear about Christmas and all that, but it doesn't mean that much to you. Would you recognize today that that baby that Simeon held in his arms changed human history? Our calendars were literally changed by this baby. It went from B.C., before Christ, to the year of our Lord, Anno Domini, A.D. And so, Father, there's someone here today who's never bowed the knee and by faith received the promised gift of the Holy Spirit and the gift of life and salvation. Right now, would you, just in the quietness of this moment, say, God, thank you for sending Jesus, Jesus, Thank you for living a life I could not live and dying on a cross for me, being my consolation, my hope of life in this life and my eternal hope in the next. Come into my life, Lord Jesus, and thank you for forgiving me and saving me and changing me. Help me follow you, Jesus, all the days of my life as you continue to pray. Father, someone right here today has had a promise. God, help them not give up on the promises. Help them keep a firm grip on these promises that will keep them going and going and going until the right time, your time, that you show up and fulfill your word. Incredible name.